Hey folks, you guys are in for a treat today because I've got an interview with Professor Radin. He co-taught my 703 genetics class and I hope you guys enjoy. Okay everyone, right now I'm walking to the Whitehead Institute, which is where Professor Radin works. But I figured I'd just give you a quick shot of the new Coke Research Center, which is where all the cancer research stuff goes on at MIT. It's really pretty. People are probably thinking I'm talking to myself and that I'm weird, but I guess that's just part of the job hazard, people thinking I'm weird. New Coke building? Old Coke building. Alright, so this is Broad Institute. Whitehead's over here. And this is where I'm going. Hi everyone, we're sitting in Professor Radin's office right now. And I'm going to do an interview because I got some requests for it. So my first question is, how exactly did you end up at MIT? Well, I ended up at MIT um, about five and a half years ago uh, in a faculty position um, because I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to set up a lab here and start as a professor here and found it to really match my scientific style. You know, the place, first of all, has a very strong emphasis on science, which I love. I love spending my time uh, thinking about science, doing science, and so it's a great fit for me. Secondly, um, the uh, department I'm in, the Department of Biology, I think has a, uh, a really strong positive uh, and, um, uh, culture and, uh, and a strong science um, uh, background. And so uh, it, it's a very good department for me because I feel like I fit in well with the style of the department. Finally, the, uh, the opportunities for research and uh, interacting with others here at MIT um, are uh, hard to beat. So that's how I came here. Um, I know that you talked a little bit during class about the things you're doing in your lab. Do you mind talking a little bit about what your research specialty is? Sure, happy to. So, uh, my lab works on regeneration. So we're captivated with the question of how animals regrow missing body parts. You can remove the arm, let's say, of a salamander and it grows back. Or crush the spinal cord of a fish and it can swim again. Some animals are capable of regeneration of entire organisms from tiny fragments of the body. For example, the animal we work on is called a planarian flatworm, and it can regrow any missing part of the body. The musculature, the nervous system, the epidermis, everything can be regrown following the injury. And we do not know how this works mechanistically in any of these animals that are capable of regeneration. So we want to find some answers. How does, how does regeneration work at the molecular and cellular level? So my lab seeks the genes and the genetic programs that control regeneration. Interesting. So I'll put up a picture of it, but on the last lecture he showed us a planarian with six heads, was it? Six heads. Six heads. So many heads! This one actually has more than six, but you totally get the picture. One of the things we work on is the question interesting question of how animals know what part of their body to regenerate following an injury. So if you remove just a part of the brain of the planarian, it will regrow that missing part. How did it know? Or how did it know it was missing its entire head? So we found a process that happens at wounds that is essentially controlling a molecular decision. So this process throws a switch either to regrow a head if a head is missing or a tail if a tail is missing. If we break that switch by manipulating the genes that control the system, then we can get animals that regenerate in quite interesting ways, such as with two heads or even up to six heads. Well, what's your favorite part about being a professor? Um, you know, my favorite part about being a professor I have to say, it's really getting to spend all of my time thinking about interesting things. So, uh, you know, being a professor, I, I love it. You know, I, I really I love almost all aspects of it. Um, when preparing lectures or working with a, a class I'm, uh, or talking to the students, um, I'm always thinking about things that I find fascinating. Uh, and with my research, working on things that I'm captivated by. So I get to spend so much of my time thinking about interesting things and um, 
but this really stimulates me, so that's my favorite part. Did you always want to be a researcher? Or, like, growing up as a kid, were you always like, I want to be a scientist when I grow up? I think so, for the most part. You know, I, I, I you know, there, there were other interests I had, certainly, but um, I, uh, I've had a long-standing interest in science, and I was um, always captivated by uh, NASA and JPL and uh, um, physics and all aspects of science. So um, I, I, I think I always wanted to uh, to do something in science, and uh, research has really been just a great match for me. Who were your science heroes growing up, or who are the scientific people that you look up to today? That's a good question. I, I think, you know, it's, it's hard to say, but one, you know, growing up, a science hero was, uh, you know, was a common one, uh, Richard Feynman. I, uh, I was much younger, I read Shirley, Shirley You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, and uh, liked it quite a bit, and uh, really have, have enjoyed his uh, uh, reading about and seeing uh, his scientific style and uh, his passion, and um, so that was one growing up. Um, later, uh, I think T.H. Uh, Morgan, who um, is the founder of Drosophila Genetics, uh, he, I, he's, he's a hero uh, not just for his pioneering work in, in genetics, but for his less known work. Less known is the fact that he uh, also used to work on planarians, which of these organisms my lab work, works on. So some of the very early, late 1800s, early 1900s, foundational experiments with planarian regeneration were done by T.H. Morgan, the same founder of Drosophila Genetics. And I've always found his papers um, a pleasure to read and uh, his, his thinking about scientific problems to be very clear, and I uh, admired that. So T.H. Morgan would be one. A second uh, scientist uh, to, to look up to uh, would be Sidney Brenner, who did countless fascinating and important things. One of those things he did in science was to uh, help found, essentially was the founder of the field C. elegans genetics. Uh, developing C. elegans, which is a small roundworm nematode, as a model system for studying many, many aspects of uh, biology. And he has uh, an adventurous spirit uh, in his science that uh, I, I really admire. And I think science should be an adventure when done, done you know, well. I, I think that's, that's the, the, the way I love, like to approach science, is to think about us charting into the unknown and trying to make discoveries. And, I sensed a, a, a spirit of that in his work, so. Science is an adventure! I seriously want to make a shirt out of this. It would be one. So as much fun as you have in the lab and in doing research, what are the kinds of things you like to do for fun outside of academics? Well, I, uh, I do enjoy being in the lab a lot and being, you know, thinking about science a lot, so that is, that's, for me, not just a job, but it's something I, I love to do in, in my free time as well. Um, so uh, it, there's there's so many uh, interesting things to do and, and to think about that uh, it can be quite a bit of fun. But I also like other things. I uh, I like to uh, bicycle and um, to hike. I've done uh, quite a bit of backpacking. And, uh, I also um, like writing fiction. So uh, I do a lot less of that now than I. I uh, used to, or that I would, I, would, I would like to still do it, but I have less time for it now. But uh, those are some things I like doing outside of uh, being a professor. There you have it, folks. Professor Peter Reddian, proof that at MIT, not only are the students semi-normal, but the professors are pretty awesome. And they do things for fun outside of being professors. <laughs>